you. So I'm Sujan Chinoy, uh, the Director General of the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. And it is my good fortune to welcome you this afternoon for what promises to be uh, yet another very interesting webinar, this time on COVID-19 and the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, and we will be featuring uh, a very, very distinguished uh, uh, speaker today. Guest speaker is Mr. Daniel uh, Feeks. Uh, I can see that, Daniel, you are on the line too. So welcome. Welcome to you. Good afternoon to you. I'm here. Thank you, Ambassador. Good afternoon to you as well. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I also want to acknowledge the presence uh, with us this afternoon of Ambassador Pankaj Sharma, our permanent representative uh, to the CD in Geneva. Uh, he is with us, uh, and therefore I extend a very warm welcome to Ambassador Sharma as well. That being said, uh, I want to very quickly, now it being uh, 2.59, I think we can just about start rolling. So, as I said before, this is uh, uh, a very interesting webinar that we have this afternoon, and it's all about the BWC. There are among you people who know a lot more about the BWC than I can uh, claim to know, uh, but I will put in my two penny bit uh, at this stage, which is to say that the BWC uh, has uh, been a bit in the news uh, of late because, uh, uh, frankly, because of the coronavirus. We've seen that uh, at a strategic level, uh, global opinion is increasingly, uh, you know, uh, weighted against China, uh, notwithstanding China's uh, efforts to salvage credibility by speaking of its uh, contributions to containing the virus and the superiority of its political and ideological systems. The problem is that uh, uh, people who didn't really research the BWC are all looking at the BWC today. And they're doing so because of uh, various theories about the coronavirus having, uh, you know, originated in a laboratory in Wuhan with many theories about biological warfare programs and uh, possible accidental release. So that's what gets uh, lay people to start looking at what the BWC is all about. And it's obviously an opportune moment to turn the spotlight on the inherent weaknesses uh, of the BWC, which uh, after all is a disarmament treaty, but one which does not pro you know, prohibit the retention and use of biological agents, including coronaviruses for that matter, for prophylactic uh, purposes, which uh, also include, uh, you know, medical research for diagnosis and immunization, etc. And unlike uh, things like the, uh, you know, WMD treaties like the NPT and the CWC, the one major limitation of the BWC, there may be other limitations as well, but the one major limitation is that it has no verification protocol. It has no means to accept on the basis of goodwill and good faith uh, to deal with any suspected use of biological agents. Now, of course, it is possible, uh, you know, for the UNSC, the UN Security Council, uh, to investigate complaints in this regard if a reference is made. Uh, but then the veto power enjoyed by, you know, certain permanent members uh, renders this uh, a virtual impossibility. So there again, it's like a, a, a dead end as far as reference to the UNSC is concerned. We've seen the kind of politics that have been uh, associated with the 73rd assembly of the WHA, uh, the two-day uh, assembly, which also is underway right now as we speak. And so in all this, uh, uh, you know, broad sort of context, uh, we would also like to hear from our guest speaker today how he sees all this and how he sees uh, the possibility of uh, strengthening the verification, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects of the BWC in the run-up to the ninth review conference uh, of the, the BWC in 2021. Now, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that the government of India uh, has made its views known in the past quite clearly. The Ministry of External Affairs uh, has been vocal on this issue. It's called on all states parties uh, to the BWC to recommit themselves to full and effective implementation of the convention and full compliance with it in letter and spirit. And our Ministry of External Affairs has also reiterated the need 
for putting in place a comprehensive and legally binding protocol, having a non-discriminatory verification mechanism to strengthen norms to deal with biological weapons. Uh, so, I mean, generally speaking, it can it can be safely said that a strong BWC is certainly, you know, the need of the hour, uh, especially when the lines between, uh, you know, research uh, and uh, weapons uh, defensive and offensive, uh, these are being blurred, even in the scientific sense of the term. Uh, so, of course, it's uh, true that the BWC has no direct correlation to the management of the COVID uh, pandemic and this unfolding crisis, but it is related. It's a related field. And uh, obviously, those that are required to think about these weighty matters uh, ought to be uh, doing so. So, with these few words, uh, and having said my little piece, I actually wish to uh, invite uh, our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Daniel Feeks, Chief of the Implementation Support Unit, uh, ISU, of the uh, BWC in Geneva to speak to us. I'm going to request him to speak to us for about uh, uh, perhaps 25 uh, minutes or so, uh, and then we will follow that with uh, uh, with a q and a session uh, for the q and a session might i suggest that uh, to the extent possible you please use the chat box it will make it easier to control the flow of events and the sequence if you have questions kindly keep them brief uh, terse succinct so that i can make sense of it uh, and of course if there is any uh, point on which you must intervene uh, personally please do let me know in the chat box and I will do my best to accommodate you as well. Uh, so we are flexible in this regard uh, and we hope that this will uh, once again turn out to be uh, a very, very enlightening uh, and stimulating talk. Uh, I will also keep open the possibility uh, that our uh, uh, PR in Geneva, Ambassador Sharma, uh, if he so chooses to, might uh, wish to come in and say a few words and he'll be most welcome. Uh, so, with these few words, I, as uh, DG of the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense uh, Studies and Analyses, welcome you all this afternoon and uh, hand over the floor now to our guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Fix. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Ambassador, um, and to all of your colleagues. Good afternoon to all participants there in to be able to be to be doing this. I've got good memories of my visit to the Institute and to Delhi um, earlier this year, back in January as well. So it's nice. It's nice to see you again, Ambassador, and it's good to be in touch to see um, see colleagues on the screen here as well. So hopefully everyone can can hear and see me very well. I'm speaking to you as I guess many others are from my house here at the moment. We haven't been into the office. We haven't been into the UN here in Geneva for about, I think, 10, 10 weeks now. So it's been a while that we've all been working from home like millions and millions of other people around the world are doing so as well. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, Ambassador. I will try um, do my best to touch on some of those points that you raised in your introduction. And I, um, it's good that you also mentioned that Ambassador Sharma is on the line. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to appreciate India's active role in the Biological Weapons Convention um, dating back, well, before, but also specifically during my time here in Geneva, when Ambassador Amandeep Singh Gill chaired the um, meeting of states parties in 2017, which set up the current intercessional program that we're working on now. And also things like India's contributions to the sponsorship program recently to the working capital fund of the BWC and its work in areas like um, an initiative on science and technology in international security and an initiative to establish a database for Article 7 of the Biological Weapons Convention as well. So I think India has been playing um, for many years a very active role within the Biological Weapons Convention as well. And I'm you know, very happy to now be working with Ambassador Sharma, who's a, a good friend of mine from our days together at the OPCW in The Hague as well, when we worked on chemical weapons issues together. Um, I've prepared some slides, so I'm hopefully going to be able to share those with you now. I'll see see how this works hopefully it will it will work okay. i'll go to the first one and then i will go through these slides and then basically as you said ambassador happy very happy to answer any questions that anybody has as well so um 
you can see the title here on the screen, the title which the Institute asked me to speak about. So hopefully I will address some of these some of these issues that you raised already in your introduction, Director General. Um, so here I think everyone knows the situation that the, the world faces at the moment. As of yesterday, there's over four and a half million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including over 300,000 deaths which have been reported to the WHO, as you can see from the map. The virus has spread pretty much around the world. Almost every country is um, has been or is being affected by this virus. The Secretary General of the United Nations spoke to the World Health Assembly via video conference yesterday and said that deadly global threats like this require a new unity and solidarity. Um, and here's just a quick summary again. We're all quite familiar, um, unfortunately, with these statistics, I think. The WHO declared um, the COVID-19 pandemic, well, well, the COVID-19 virus, a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January. WHO then characterized it as a pandemic on the 11th of March. The available scientific evidence indicates the natural origins of the virus, similar to other recent coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS. And as, as we all know, and you mentioned already, Ambassador WHO, its World Health Assembly is meeting here in Geneva um, yesterday and today. And it's a WHO that's really leading the international public health response. Obviously, nation states themselves are doing their, um, you know, their own national response um, um, operations as well. And as you mentioned already, Ambassador, there's no direct role for the Biological Weapons Convention in the current situation, but there are likely going to be important trends lessons from this current pandemic for the Biological Weapons Convention. Just trying to move to the next. Okay, so this issue of lessons learned from pandemics and epidemics in the past is something which has happened previously. This is a, a quote um, and relating to the Ebola outbreak, which happened in West Africa in 2014. And you can see here a quote from the 2015 meeting of states parties to the Biological Weapons Convention, in which the, the members of the convention recognized the strong similarities and differences between responses to a deliberate disease and a natural outbreak. But they also noted the importance of drawing lessons in that case from that particular um, Ebola disease outbreak. And then going further forwards into 2016, the eighth review conference of the biological weapons took place. And at that conference, um, the members noted the uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa and how it had underlined the importance of rapid detection and prompt, effective and coordinated response in addressing outbreaks of infectious disease. So there's already um, precedent and examples from the past, from the recent past, when BW states parties have um, looked at previous natural outbreaks and um, decided to learn lessons from those as well. And it's also this current situation, the current pandemic has been reflected by a number of BWC states parties. There's three of them here on the screen, which all made statements um, on the occasion of the 45th anniversary of the convention, which took place on the 26th of March this year. It's the 45th anniversary of these convention entering into force. And you can see here, including a statement by the Ministry of External Affairs of India, which the Director General just referred to, each of these countries, including Russia and the US, which are both depositories of the depository governments of the Biological Weapons Convention, talking about the need to strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention, particularly in the light of the current COVID-19 um, pandemic as well. And then um, more recently than that as well, on the 9th of April, when he addressed the United Nations Security Council, the Secretary General of the UN um, said that the weaknesses and the lack of preparedness exposed by the pandemic provide a window onto how a bioterrorist attack might unfold and may increase its risks. So again, as you mentioned already, Ambassador, you know, people, states, leaders are looking in this current context at the Biological Weapons Convention and at the issues which it addresses as well. Again, it's not, as I mentioned already, directly linked. It's not directly related, but it is something that is being raised and is being discussed already. And there are some um, some lessons which will potentially 
when the when the right time comes be be learned by the biological weapons convention and its member states so just moving on to quickly give a kind of a nutshell description of the biological weapons convention you mentioned already ambassador it's a disarmament convention which is you know it's it's a total disarmament prohibition a disarmament regime prohibiting the development production stockpiling acquisition retention and transfer of biological weapons the use of biological weapons which doesn't appear on that list was of course already covered by the international community through the 1925 geneva protocol as i mentioned already it's a, a fairly old convention entering into force in 1975 and it was in fact the first multilateral disarmament treaty which banned an entire category of weapons of mass destruction it's comprehensive in its scope it's non-discriminatory in its nature it's of unlimited duration and open to any um, state in the world we currently have 183 states parties meaning that there are 14 states which haven't joined the convention yet four of those 14 have actually signed the convention but have not yet ratified it and as you mentioned, Ambassador, and the final point here on this slide, that there is no um, autonomous, um, independent international organization for the Biological Weapons Convention comparable, for example, to the International Atomic Energy Agency or the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and also no inbuilt verification mechanism. It's an old convention, as I mentioned. You can see here a few pictures taken from uh, the UN building in Geneva. This is the predecessor to the Conference on Disarmament, where the convention was negotiated in the late 1960s, early 1970s. It was very much, as you can see here, a product of the, the bipolar um, situation in the Cold War, the US and USSR being the co-chairs of the negotiations that took place there. What the convention does, one of the important things is that it codifies a, a long standing and a really widespread norm and a taboo against the use of disease as a weapon. This, this kind of fear, this abhorrence, this illegitimacy of using disease as a weapon is not something new, it's not something just from the 20th century. This, you can look back across different cultures, across different times for centuries. And you can find that we as humans have some, you know, some fear of disease being used as a weapon. It's indiscriminate. It's, you know, often invisible. Its effects can be, you know, terif terrible and terrifying as well. And you can see a quote here from the preamble of the convention, which said that the use of biological weapons is repugnant to the conscience of mankind. And I think that quite um, neatly encapsulates the, this long-standing taboo that we as humans, wherever we come from, have had of the idea of disease being used as a weapon. Here are some of the main provisions of the Biological Weapons Convention as well. It's a, it's a short convention. As I mentioned, it doesn't contain any detailed provisions for verification. So it, it's a fairly short um, and you know quite high-level convention in some ways. You can see all the provisions. I won't read through these main articles of the convention here, but two which are particularly relevant um, to the discussion now are the, are the last two here, Article 7 and Article 10. Article 7 deals with um, assistance to states parties if they've been um, exposed to a danger as a result of a violation of the BWC, for example, if a state has been attacked by biological weapons. And Article 10 is about promoting the peaceful uses of biological science and technology and the ideas of international cooperation in scientific um, conduct and research. And just to compare, you mentioned already, Ambassador, different um, weapons of mass destruction regimes. So you can see the other kind of main regimes um, featured here on this table, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the BWC itself, and also the um, Chemical Weapons Convention as well. The numbers of states parties, as I mentioned, BWC has 183. But as you can see, in comparison to the other BWCs, it's not have a verification um, regime. There were negotiations during the 1990s, um, for most of that decade, in fact, to negotiate and to conclude a um, legally binding protocol to the convention, which would have included verification provisions. Those um, negotiations unfortunately failed in 2001, and um, there hasn't been the political um, consensus basically to restart those negotiations since then. So there is no self-standing organization for the BWC comparable to the IAEA, CTBTO or OPCW. 
and that means that there's also a fairly low level of resources actually dedicated to the Biological Weapons Convention. Instead of a budget in the hundreds or tens of millions of dollars or euros, you can see that the total annual budget for the BWC is just 1.5 million US dollars per year. And we have a staff of um, three within the implementation support unit, which is, is augmented by others working under different projects um, via voluntary contributions from states parties and also from the European Union. Um, just in terms of the budget as I mentioned, you can see on the left here, the, the red line in the top um, graph is the, is the full amount, the 1.5 million, which is all comes from states parties to the convention, the members of the convention through assessed contributions. As you can see this year so far, we've only received around about 80 percent of those assessed contributions as well, which has implications for the activities that we can con conduct in the meetings. We also, in the last couple of years, um, states parties agreed to establish what's called a working capital fund, which helps to address these shortfalls that can occur in the receipt of assessed contributions. Um, that fund has now received the amount you can see there, um, just over 370,000. US dollars, and I mentioned before um, the contribution from India. You can see that reflected there as well to the working capital. So, kind of to sum up that, that that part of the presentation, the main functions of the BWC, you can really see it provides an unequivocal norm against biological weapons. It acts as the sole multilateral forum for dialogue concerning all these different issues relating to biological weapons in a holistic manner. It facilitates assistance and cooperation at the bilateral and multilateral level and helps to build capacity in its member states. It supports the promotion of peaceful uses of biological science and technology and facilitates assistance and cooperation to develop those capacities. It also offers a mechanism for consultation and cooperation in solving any problems, any ambiguities that may arise and builds transparency through its um, system of annual reporting the, the confidence building measures regime. Just to talk about how things actually function at the, the moment, we have an intercessional program. This is the, the annual kind of package of meetings. I mentioned that this was um, agreed in 2017 under Ambassador Gill's um, chairmanship of the meeting of states parties in that year. And what we have now in the summertime, five meetings of experts, you can see them listed here, MX1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 on different topics, which you can see here on the screen. Um, obviously, this year, one of the implications and one of the, you know, the very practical implications of the current pandemic is that we are not yet um, certain that these meetings will actually take place in their planned and originally scheduled format and time um, here in Geneva. That um, it's it's not clear yet. That obviously depends on um, restrictions in place at the UN itself. Here, it depends on. Um, restrictions imposed by the Swiss authorities on entry into the country and the availability of experts to come to Geneva from other countries as well. So we are obviously hoping and we're planning that these meetings take place, but it's like I said, it's not yet clear that they will. Um, but obviously the current situation, it, it's extremely relevant. Um, so if they can't take place physically, we will hopefully be able to find a way that the meetings can take place much as we're discussing now um, virtually via some um, online platform. So we have these five um, substantive technical meetings. We had those already last year and in 2018 as well, and they were very successful and very good expert exchanges took place. And then also the meeting of states parties, which is the more political um, meeting, which takes place um, later in the year, usually in December time for four days as well. And so that one is scheduled currently at the moment for the 8th to the 11th of December. Um, this year, and we're hoping that that one will indeed go ahead as as planned. And then the other element really of this um, current intercessional program is what you refer to and what the, the unit that I had here in Geneva, this implementation support unit, which is a small unit. I mentioned already we are um, formally as created by the review conference, three people. Um, it's the first institutional presence for the Biological Weapons Convention. When it was established in 2000 or agreed in 2006 and established in 2007. Before that, the convention was serviced on a kind of a temporary basis by um, staff from the Office for Disarmament Affairs. We are host, um, hosted here in Geneva by the Office for Disarmament Affairs. And as I mentioned before, funded by assessed contributions from all BWC states parties. 
the complement of the ISU itself is three full time staff, but then we also have other colleagues um, working with us either through voluntary contributions from states parties or um, particularly um, through a contribution and a, a long running contribution from the European Union in support of the Biological Weapons Convention. So I just wanted to talk specifically now, I mentioned before the, the key articles for this um, in this particular context for the of the convention are really Article 7 and Article 10. So I just wanted to highlight some of the activities that we and um, states parties are conducting in relation to both of those articles. So first here you can see some examples of things being done currently at the moment under Article 7 and these obviously aren't being done specifically because of COVID-19. These Many of these are long running projects that have been underway um, for a few years beforehand. But obviously they are they have a new relevance and increased relevance now as well. So with funding from Canada, France, Japan and the European Union, we're undertaking various different activities. For example, the development of an international bioemergency management framework at the level of different international, different relevant international organizations. We've conducted and are con hoping to continue and conclude a series of um, regional workshops for capacity building in Southeast and Central Asia. The same project there, we're also conducting awareness raising seminars in Geneva. Um, we've just begun, we had the first in a series of um, webinars on similar topics to the ones we're discussing today um, that began last week and we'll do a, a series of those webinars over the next few months. We're also looking into the establishment of a database for Article 7 of the Convention as has been proposed by France and India. And with the support from the European Union, we're doing capacity building activities for national protective programs in um, four developing countries, Fiji, Nigeria, Sri Lanka and Sudan. And then since the pandemic began, we've also been sending to our national contact points, which we have in over 125 um, BWC states parties, we've been sending out a kind of a weekly listing of information that has been shared with us, um, useful information related to the um, response to COVID-19 pandemic. And on the Article 10 um, side of things, so if you recall, this was the one about um, promoting peaceful uses of biology. We have a, a standing mandate to, to maintain and to operate a cooperation and assistance database. This is a kind of a matchmaking function where states parties which can provide assistance, um, they, they record that in the data. States parties that are seeking assistance record their requests in the database and we try to the extent that we can to kind of match those requests and offers up with each other. We're also, as I mentioned before, with the European Union support, doing a range of different capacity building activities, for example, fostering biosecurity networks of young scientists in the global south. We had a workshop here in Geneva on this last year. We are hoping to have another one this year, but again, um, many of our meetings and kind of external activities are unfortunately on hold because of the current travel restrictions. And we're also providing support to five developing countries for their own national um, assistance programs as well. So for national capacity building in those countries. We also oversee a sponsorship program which allows um, experts from developing countries to attend BWC meetings in Geneva. I mentioned that's um, funded through voluntary contributions. I mentioned earlier that India contributed to that fund as well. And then we've in the past had a project and we're just now um, negotiating with Norway um, for a future project supported by Norway, again on Article 10 issues as well, which would have some elements relating to training for experts from developing countries, as well as other more conceptual issues relating to Article 10, as well as to the cooperation and assistance database that I just mentioned as well. And then, um, Ambassador, you already mentioned in your introduction that one of the things on the on the horizon, as well as the the short term with the meetings this year, um, is the ninth review conference that that's um, scheduled to take place in November of next year. Now, the way the BWC operates, every five years the review conferences take place. Um, they are really the opportunity at which decisions can actually be taken because the annual meetings that I refer to do not have a um, decision making mandate. So it's really every five years where, you know, significant and important decisions on the BWC and its implementation can take place. So that's why there's a really big 
big focus and quite a big burden on those conferences as well and for the preparation of those conferences too. The president designate of the conference has not yet been identified, but it will be um, someone coming from the, the NAM um, group of states parties to the Biological Weapons Convention on the principle of rotation. The last review conference in 2016 was chaired by the East European group. And as I mentioned, I mean, the, the main role of the review conference is really, you know, it's it's a high level strategic meeting to look at, to review the, the past operation of the convention and also to kind of take decisions for its future implementation. It, it's each review conference really that decides on the next, what happens in the next intercessional program. So right now, for example, the current process will finish. The annual meetings I mentioned before will finish this year. Um, the implementation support unit, our mandate only continues as far as the review conference. So the review conference next year will hopefully, um, you know, renew the mandate and maybe adjust as necessary the mandate of both the intercessional program and the implementation support unit. And it's also the review conferences that take, um, you know, sub substantive decisions as well. For example, the introduction of the confidence building measures, the annual reports I mentioned earlier, that was done by a decision of review conference. Um, also the establishment of the negotiations um, to uh, for a legally binding instrument to the BWC was mandated by a review conference and then um, established by a special conference. So review conferences are really, really significant events for the, the evolution of the BWC. And they also have, as you can see here on the slide, an important role in addressing scientific and technological developments. That that issue of um, science and technology is specifically mandated in Article 12 of the Convention as well. So just some concluding slides moving away slightly from the Convention itself and, and back more to the context that we're currently in. Um, we can see, I mean, this on the screen here is, is not, not something that we've produced. It's something produced by experts at Johns Hopkins University and NTI in the US published with the Economist Intelligence Unit. They did this Global Health Security Index and they basically scored different countries in the world. You can see the results there. Like I said, it's not something that we, we were involved in. It's not something we necessarily endorse, but it gives an overall um, picture of the state of preparedness in around the world. Obviously, this was done before the current pandemic. This this is from last year. And you can see that the overall average score, 40.2 out of 100, is fairly low. And as they pointed, they said even countries, they said no country is fully prepared for ep epidemics or pandemics. Every country has important gaps. And you can see that even some of the countries highlighted there as being the most prepared are now you know, struggling with responses to the current pandemic as well. And then there are other things as well that give a global picture of the state of preparedness. Um, for example, um, the, um, the numbers of countries I mentioned before, we have 183 states parties, 14 countries have not yet joined the Biological Weapons Convention. And also from information that states have submitted under UN Security Council Resolution 1540, it's apparent that the area of regulations, legislation addressing biological weapons is, is the area compared with nuclear and chemical weapons legislation. Uh, it's biological weapons legislation that is the area of least activity and, and least legislation. So, you know, these, these things together, I think, demonstrate that the, you know, the level of and the level of um, instruments in place for prevention of biological weapons is, is lower and is you know that definitely in need of some improvement and it also links to the sustainable development goals the sdgs particularly sdg3 on good health and well-being and particularly target 3d of this one as well which talks about the links with the international health regulations and the biological weapons convention has has recognized the members of the convention have recognized the international health regulations as being you know relevant and complementary to the convention and you can see here a quote from the eighth review conference that says that capacity building at the national and international level is the most immediate imperative for enhancing and strengthening the capacity of states parties to um, detect and respond to the alleged use of biological weapons and the fact that health and security issues are interrelated at both the national and international levels. So I think this gives you, um, you know, this, this idea that 
by you know, and I think it's particularly clear in the current situation as well. And you can see two two quotes here from yesterday at the World Health Assembly here in Geneva, one from the UN Secretary General and one from the Director General of the WHO, saying that, you know, these these issues are all interlinked. Um, if we have stronger national health systems and national preparedness capacities, those will help obviously to deal with natural events as we're seeing now, but they will also help in the case that there ever are um, deliberate disease events as well through biological weapons, for example. So, you know, the one complements the other. Obviously, natural outbreaks are a much more common occurrence than, than deliberate outbreaks and the use of biological weapons. But by having strong national health systems, you know, under the rubric of universal health coverage and the work that WHO is doing um, in that area, of strengthening national health systems. Those national strong national health systems are obviously a very good thing, full stop. Um, but obviously they also have their, their benefits in the case that um, biological weapons would ever be used. And they may also, having strong national health systems may also um, act to some extent as a deterrent against anyone that was actually thinking of using biological weapons. If you know that a country or a region or the world even is, is well prepared to deal with um, you know, infectious disease outbreaks, then the temptation to use biological weapons may well be be reduced as well. Um, so I'll stop there. That's the final slide. You can see our, our contact details on the screen here as well. Um, but obviously, I'm very happy to to try and uh, answer any any questions that, that anyone may have. I saw a couple of things popping up as I was speaking. Um, so I, I, I assume there are some questions coming in already. Thank you. Thank Andrew. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Feeks, for that very illuminating talk that you just gave us. Um, before I turn to the questions that have appeared, popped up in the chat box, uh, I just wanted to reflect uh, more on a couple of points and perhaps draw you out. I mean, you did say that uh, the BWC review conferences of the past have reflected on other diseases and pandemics like the Ebola, etc. But can you truly say that there were lessons learned? And if so, uh, why is it that we are in such a bad shape today? I mean, overall, globally. Uh, there is also a kind of uh, reference to terrorist groups uh, might wanting to turn their, you know, sort of focus on uh, stealing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, coronaviruses and, and such biological agents uh, for possible use as weapons. And so does this really raise uh, uh, a big red flag on the kind of security that we provide to laboratories, I mean, they're not exactly for Knox, you know, in terms of the manner in which they are protected. Um, uh, uh, laboratories that may have nuclear material are possibly protected uh, much better. So maybe you can reflect on that. Mm -hmm. Disease as a weapon, uh, we are aware that uh, disease as a weapon has been used in history also. And one, uh, just one example, of course, is a well-known example of Hernan Cortes, who had used uh, disease as a weapon against the indigenous people when uh, conquering Nueva España, which is Mexico today. Uh, so there is a, a case history there too. Uh, your budget at $1.5 million and three people obviously seems uh, to be very, very meager. And do you imagine that you will now have a great outpouring of generosity on the part of member states to strengthen your own budgets and would you be wary of receiving a sudden generous grant from the Chinese, for instance? Uh, you know what those implications would be. Um, uh, you spoke of MX4 course in your presentation, uh, assistance, response and preparedness. Uh, so I'm just imagining that you do have uh, uh, a case file on the state of preparedness that you as uh, you know, the uh, uh, sort of holders of the BWC uh, have to uh, share with the rest of the world. Um, now, uh, why should the BWC uh, not have a direct role in pandemics is a question from there. I want to take off uh, and pose to you, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar's question. Can the BWC suo uh, motto uh, investigate events considering that some of these may have been banned. In, in other words, entry is banned. It's all voluntary. Inspections are voluntary. Uh, and, and can forensics be used uh, uh, at the start of a pandemic? Uh, 
my own addition to that question would be can you devise a system where any pandemic occasions a certification by the bwc that is not connected to bioweapons is that uh, theoretically uh, a possibility let me quickly move over to some of the uh, other questions uh, why are defense labs involved in this kind kind of research in the first place uh, i mean why can't we have a tighter system there whereby people give up uh, you know this whole business of research uh, that can be so dangerous um, what steps uh, dhruv asks uh, have been taken till now by the bwc in respect of the pandemic uh, you did say and i did mention you don't have a direct role there uh, but even so, um, Air Marshal Manmohan Bahadur uh, wishes to ask a question in person, so I'll come to him after I've read out the other questions in the chat box. Um, Dr. Ajay Lele, who I must thank for having uh, facilitated this afternoon's uh, session, he is with our own institute here. Uh, he asks, can we say that China is in violation of Article uh, 4? Um, uh, Munish Sharma, uh, who is also with us at the Institute uh, and works on uh, technology and other related issues, he asks, how does the BWC differentiate between a biological weapon and an accidental, unintentional release of bioagents? Kritika Roy from our Institute asks, why has it been difficult for the state party, states parties uh, to agree on a biosecurity code of conduct, considering China's attitude to the towards the misuse of biotechnology, uh, it's become very clear um, that uh, you know more should be done on this front uh, with regard to editing genomes, etc. Um, there is another question. In fact, I see that RPR uh, in Geneva, Ambassador Pankaj Sharma will also be happy to take the floor. So I'll turn to him. Uh, as soon as I finish this. Um, and we have uh, one or two more. Let me just go through this quickly. Um, Shruti Sharma uh, wishes to know, uh, she says there is no existing monitoring and verification mechanism. Can BWC play any role in terms of an independent probe into the origins of the coronavirus? You can see all these are somewhat related. Uh, Shambhavi Nayak says, how important would a scientific advisory board be for the BWC to predict and assess biological threats and uh, origin of pandemics? At this stage, I would like uh, the webmaster to unmute uh, the uh, microphone uh, of uh, Ambassador Pankaj Sharma uh, in Geneva. After that, I will turn to Air Marshal Bahadur to make his uh, short comment or ask his question. Uh, Ambassador Sharma, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, sir, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank you for inviting me to this seminar. When you were welcoming me, um, I didn't respond because uh, of Pavlovian reflex, and I must tell you why. Because whenever you say Ambassador Sharma, my mind actually goes to Ambassador Shilkan Sharma. Uh, he has, I, I want to acknowledge his presence also. <laughs> Ambassador Shilka Sharma is also there. So, yes, so, you know, I've, I've never been able to uh, uh, move away from that uh, name because Ambassador Shilka Sharma is the one who taught me the BWC, CWC, and many other disarmament treaties when I joined the disarmament division back in 2002. So, so once again, I acknowledge uh, uh, Ambassador Shilka Sharma's presence. I also see Ambassador Anil Vadva and other mentor in the Chemical Weapons Convention, who was also an OPCW. Daniel already told that Daniel and I worked together in the OPCW, both as secretary colleagues, but also uh, when I was at the mission. Uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, and sir, uh, uh, what I, at the outset, let me uh, just sound a word of caution here, that while this seminar is happening in the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic, we must distinguish between the mandates of the BWC, ISU, and WHO. And why I say this is because, as also Daniel mentioned, any health pandemic and natural biological outbreak clearly lies within the mandate of the WHO. 
and it is only when a deliberate attack or deliberate use of biological and toxic weapons takes place that BWC kicks in. Now, if we start invoking BWC at every single outbreak, it definitely poses a lot of risks because then it will deflect the world's uh, the efforts and the attention of the international community from handling a natural outbreak crisis to investigative mechanisms and which have which have their own course uh, to to follow. And with that backdrop, uh, if you allow me, uh, sir, I would just make a few points uh, uh, where India stands. Please some, go ahead. Take as much time as you want. Please go ahead. Uh, some of them have already been highlighted by uh, Daniel. But I recall, let me recall the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, who, uh, Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, who said at 2018 MSP, uh, the meeting of states parties, uh, that, and she said, uh, I quote her, although its strong norm against biological warfare is being adhered to by a growing number of states parties, we must admit that the BWC is institutionally weak when compared to similar regimes. And we have maintained that institutional strengthening is a key aspect to ensure full and effective implementation of the convention, which in turn requires, which in turn requires implementation of all the articles of the convention. Any convention on treat or treaty is as good as its implementation by the states parties. Uh, in the case of biological weapons convention, National implementation has remained uneven and more concerted and coordinated efforts are necessary. This was also brought out by, by Daniel. Uh, one of the major incentives for joining the convention is opportunity for states parties to receive assistance and protection against the malicious use of biological agents. Article 7 of BWC provides for assistance. However, the convention contains no operational capacity to respond to biological attacks. And we believe and that rendering assistance is a legal obligation under Article 7 of the Convention. Uh, it is clear that the absence of clearly laid out procedures for seeking assistance and the associated techno-political legal questions related to Article 7 have led to a defic deficiency in the ability of the global community to respond effectively and provide assistance to states parties exposed to dangers as a result of violation of the BWC. And therefore, India and France had proposed establishment of a database for assistance in the framework of Article 7. Another aspect was also brought out about the threat from bioterrorism. You mentioned about the terrorists uh, acquiring weapons of mass destruction and their efforts in this direction. Now, under paragraph two of the UN Security Council Resolution 1540, enforces BWC obligations, states are required to adopt and enforce appropriate and effective laws. As for the final document on the 2016 comprehensive review of the status of implementation of UNSCR 1540, the overall implementation rate of obligations under para 2 was at 62% with regional disparities. The report noted that only 103 states have in place export control legislation for materials related to biological weapons and their means of delivery, and only 83 states have taken measures to implement the relevant licensing provisions. This is yet another indication of the deficit in the implementation of Article 3 of BWC. Recognizing the importance of building broad-based support for strengthening implementation of Article 3, India, along with the United States, has submitted a working paper uh, titled Strengthening Implementation of Article 3 of the BWC. Effective implementation of Article 3 would also ensure that cooperation envisaged under Article 10 is taken forward in mutual confidence. And it is very important to uh, provide equitable benefits for states parties, in particular to developing countries uh, from Article 10. And if we believe that this effective implementation of Article 3 will also facilitate promoting universalization of the convention, as well as uh, 
and uh, international cooperation. Unlike Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, BWC lacks a technical secretariat, as Daniel brought out, that it's just a three-person staff. And it does uh, <laughs> lack at resources, both financial and human. And therefore, it's not able to meet effectively the growing demands on the convention and the increasing expectations of the state's parties. There is thus a need to strengthen the ISU and place it on a firm and sustainable footing. Uh, uh, we heard about the upcoming review conference. Now, the, one of the issues with Biological Weapons Convention, unlike other treaties, is that the annual meetings of states parties do not have any decision-making authority. And that is something which is very unfortunate. And therefore, India has also maintained that there is a need to strengthen the intercessional process, particularly these meetings of states parties, and reinforce their authority for taking and implementing effective decisions. Otherwise, we have to wait five years, and sometimes the review conferences are not as successful as we expect them to be, or are not able to take effective decisions, and therefore, uh, the whole process is offset by another five years. And finally, uh, India has maintained that there is a need for a legally binding protocol with an effective verification mechanism, something on the lines of Chemical Weapons Convention, without which it will be very difficult to, to implement a treaty like BWC. Uh, I think I will conclude here and would be happy to respond later if there are any queries. Otherwise, uh, just wish to thank you once again, sir, and also to Dr. Ajay Lele for inviting us to this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj Sharma, for joining us and for so cogently putting across uh, the viewpoint of the government of India. I'm glad you did that. It has added value to this uh, webinar. I will now request uh, that uh, Air Marshal Bahadur take the floor. Uh, please unmute your mic and state your point uh, briefly if possible. Please unmute your mic. Yes, you've done that now. I can see that. Go ahead. Uh, th th thank you very much. Sir. Uh, my question is uh, actually, you know, it's added to by what uh, as, uh, Dr. Sharma just said, that the VWC kicks in if there is a deliberate, deliberate attack uh, using a bio agent. So the point to question to Dr. Fix is that uh, when we are aware and the VWC is aware of risk going on into genetic modification uh, of uh, agricultural crops, staple foods, uh, we had raised this point last year, sir, in the August 2019 meeting in Geneva. So I was part of the Max Plan team. This is the insect allies program of the United States. And they said it is to safeguard the crops, but the fact remains it can go rogue if there is an accident or the intention changes. They also said it is possibly for against state and non-state actors. Others are also doing this research. So sir, are we waiting for lessons learned from others to be implemented? Or when we know this research is happening, can the BWC sort of preempt and raise public opinion on this? Thank you. Thank you, Air Marshal Bahadur. Uh, as you can see, Dr. Feeks, you now have another full plate. Uh, many questions have been raised, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks very much. And thanks very much to everyone who asked questions. I was trying to keep up with what you were, the questions you were posing, plus everything in the in the chat here as well. So I'll, I'll do my best to address at least at least some of those. I know um, we have a, a, a time frame here as well. Um, so I mean, Ambassador Sharma just, just made the point very clearly as well. You know, we, the BWC itself, us in its implementation support unit, you know, our mandate is very different from that of the WHO. WHO is there, you know, it's the lead, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's the lead organization at the international level right now dealing with this um, natural um, pandemic. That's the role of the WHO. The BWC is there, as we mentioned already, it's a disarmament convention, and it would come into play in quite, you know, more limited 
circumstances, particularly given the absence of any kind of implementing organization similar to the OPCW, for example. Um, there are provisions, there are indeed provisions in the Biological Weapons Convention for investigations and for assistance to be provided in the event of a biological weapons attack. But those provisions, both in Article 6 and in Article 7 of the Convention, um, they go via the United Nations Security Council. Because there is no um, implementing organization for the convention when it was created back in the 1970s, all um, you know issues that need to be discussed collectively um, go to the UN Security Council. So any um, launching of an investigation would need to be done with Security Council approval. The same for um, assistance in the event of an attack, unless there were kind of urgent humanitarian um, concerns, that would also need to go to the UN Security Council as well. So it, it, it's very clear, you know, the BWC itself at the moment is not, you know, there is no direct, as I mentioned in my presentation, and as um, Ambassador Sharma said as well, there is no direct role right now for the Biological Weapons Convention in this particular, um, you know, these current circumstances. It hasn't been activated through the UN Security Council, as, as I mentioned. So the things, the steps that, that we are doing are things that we're doing, you know, of no, as I mentioned, no direct, um, we don't have a mandate for direct for investigation or anything like this, any forensics or anything. Um, but what we're doing is what we've been asked to do by some of our member states is to share some information, is to you know organize um, the webinar that I mentioned last week in which um, various presentations were made, information was shared, looking at best practices and things, because going back to the issue that you read, Master, of the Ebola outbreak and whether lessons were learned, I mean, that Ebola outbreak in 2014-15 in West Africa was really the beginning of the interest that we now see in Article 7 of the Biological Weapons Convention and these issues relating to assistance, response and preparedness. Before then, there was much, there was a lot less discussion of these issues. Since then, it's, certain, it's, it's really picked up. So there have been many, many studies done outside of the BWC, obviously, on the Ebola, the response to Ebola in, in West Africa. There have also been various studies done of the lessons for the BWC and lots of projects and lots of writings, working papers by countries have spun off from that as well. Because one of the key things, although there are clear differences in terms of legal and political mandates between the convention itself and the World Health Organization, there's also the, the inevitable fact that um, natural and deliberate outbreaks can, in the beginnings at least, look very, very similar. And it may be the fact that the WHO is and others are already involved on the ground dealing with an outbreak, which may then later um, be discovered, indicated in some way to have been an, a deliberate outbreak as well. So there is a large degree of crossover um, and overlap there. So um, we have been doing a lot of work uh, within the BWC and particularly within MX4, the Meeting of Experts on Assistance, Response and Preparedness, a lot of work to coordinate between the different agencies involved. There's a lot of work still to be done on that area as well because you have issues, you know, public health issues initially of dealing with the um, with the response and dealing with any outbreak, but there may then later become security issues as well. Other agencies may get involved, for example, as well as WHO at the international level, you could have Interpol involved, for example, if there was some criminal um, activity, um, you know, suspected as well. So it will change the dynamics as well. So there's obviously, as it mentioned, one of the quotes that I gave in the presentation, there are strong similarities between natural and deliberate outbreaks, but also some differences there as well. But, you know, from our point of view, we have a clearly um, quite a clear difference in mandate between um, WHO and, and BWC. And, and currently, like I said, in this context, BWC has not been um, directly activated, mandated in any sense that would require a, um, you know, a, a higher level decision, basically. But what we do have, I mean, people were asking questions about labs and research, gain of function, um, the the research that the um, Air Marshal just referred to as well. So many, many countries have research programs, whether they're governmental research, um, military research programs, or 
you know, just public health research programs, looking at diseases, studying diseases. Obviously, the study of diseases is vital to understand um, how they work and to, to try and stop them. As we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19, it's obviously, you know, scientists around the world working to understand the virus, but also to come up with a vaccine for the virus as well. So many of these, you know, much of this research has to take place. It's it, it's vital not just to combat, you know, a disease like this now or or potentially a biological weapon, but just to combat these diseases in general. We're talking about, you know, other diseases, TB, malaria, you know, not just those affecting humans, but also diseases that affect plants and animals too, which are of big concern to many countries. So that research needs to take place. And the BWC under Article 10 actually, you know, says that that research should be taking place. It should be promoted. Um, countries should work together. Um, to conduct that research as well, and I think that's a that's a key point that it's about international um, collaboration on this research, um, as well as transparency in that that kind of research that's taking place as well. Much of this, given the way that global science is conducted these days, is is transparent. Um, people move around the world. Researchers work in different countries. Many of the articles published now on COVID-19 are written by teams from, you know, different countries, multinational teams of researchers. Students study at universities in different countries around the world. So the global scientific landscape is very, um, very interconnected and very global these days. Um, but, you know, there are some, you know, there are, you know, the, the military defensive programs. There is transparency there via the confidence building measures that I mentioned before, the annual reports under the BWC, such programs. Um, the, again, the defensive programs have to be declared um, under the Biological Weapons Convention and the information there gets shared amongst all states parties. So the idea being um, to reassure and to build confidence between states parties that certain activities aren't being conducted for any kind of um, more offensive purposes. Um, so in terms of investigations, as I said, the, the BWC it has to be done through the Security Council. There is also, in terms of investigations of actual use of biological weapons and also chemical weapons, there's the mechanism which the UN Secretary General um, oversees. It's, it's called the Secretary General's mechanism. It was used most recently in 2013 in Syria to investigate chemical weapons um, incidents there. Um, so that that's another um, mechanism that could be used and which is often referred to within the context of our BWC meetings here as well. So that doesn't require a Security Council um, activation for that particular mechanism. Like I said, it's a, a mechanism under the Secretary General's authority instead. And there has been quite a lot of work on that mechanism in recent years, particularly in terms of the actual practical operation, you know, how to take samples, how to do the um, forensics that someone mentioned as well. So there has been quite a lot of work done on that um, particular issue as well. Um, in relation to someone was talking about science and technology, the um, proposal, um, a few states have proposed some kind of a, a board, a committee uh, to look at science and technology issues within the context of the BWC. As I said, it's one of the main functions of the review conferences, but they're only every five years. You can see, you know, within the five years, there's huge changes in science and technology, for example. So some have argued that five years is too long. It needs to be done on a more regular basis. We now have a, an annual meeting of experts on science and technology, but some are also proposing a, like a, a standing committee almost. And that's a quite a widely um, supported idea within uh, among states parties. And that may be something that will may have some progress made on that issue within the review conference. And I think that would be something if you have a kind of standing committee of scientific experts where issues of, you know, many of these different issues, talking about forensics, you know, all of these different issues relating to, um, you know, studying the origins, whether natural or deliberate of a particular outbreak, and then also ranging across to different assistance that can be provided, different prophylactic measures can also be considered by such a committee, and also the ways in which to promote scientific research and, you know, the, the issues relating to Article 10 um, that I mentioned uh, before as well. So it's, like I said, the, the mandate that, that we're currently operating under as the ISU is even more limited than the mandate of the BWC, which, as I mentioned, is, is limited in itself. But I think, you know, we're addressing it now. I think there is a growing interest. Ambassador Sharma, you know, referred to the need for institutional strengthening. There is obviously still 
um, uh, the negotiations that took place in the 1990s for the, the protocol, including verification provisions, you know, that those are still there. All of the working papers, all of the work that was done, including the, um, the, the chairman's draft, which came out from those negotiations, is still there, is still available. But, you know, much of those discussions, that was, what are we now, 20 years ago? So, I mean, many argue that there's a need to, you know, to look at those issues again. It's not necessarily just a case of starting from where it was left off in, 20, um, in, in 19, well, during the 1990s in 2001, technology has changed um, hugely, both for the, for the good in terms of new verification technologies, but also potentially for the bad in terms of technologies which may make it easier um, to produce biological weapons as well. Um, so yeah, it's certainly, you know, the, the whole issue of institutional strengthening for the convention is on the agenda. It's considered by one of the meetings of experts um, over the past two years and hopefully this year as well. So it's certainly something um, that is there on the agenda. We do what we can, you know, from purely from my team's point of view within the resources that we have and often looking um, and we have noticed over recent years, you know, many more countries are keen to make voluntary contributions and to, you know, study into specific areas as well. So, you know, that's that's all for the good as well. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a need, obviously, you know, for this issue to be discussed at the review conference next year. That's where, you know, these bigger um, bigger decisions can can be made, and then also decisions relating to things. I think you asked Ambassador about. Um, access to labs, you know, these issues of lab laboratory security as well. It's again, it's one of those areas that is dealt with by, by WHO and also obviously by um, national, um, you know, regulatory bodies in different countries as well. But it's also something which relates to this whole issue of prevention as well. I mean, the, the BWC Article 4, the BWC in particular, talks about prohibiting and preventing. So I think, you know, the prohibition side of things is it's not necessarily easy, but it, it's easier. You have statutes, you have laws on the books. The prevention side, you know, is, is much more complicated in some ways as well. There's a whole range, a whole kind of web of different measures that need to be adopted in terms of prevention, which can range right down to um, issues of education for students so that students entering into the life sciences, for example, appreciate and are aware of the risks, you know, the, the dual use risks that may be involved and issues of um, someone was mentioning about codes of conduct and things as well. So scientists are aware of the of the risks of the potential risks and can anticipate the risks of um, that, that may be attendant with their research as well. So so prevention is something that stretches very broadly. It's also something that the UN itself, the Secretary General, is particularly interested in this whole area of prevention, you know, conflict prevention. But I think this prevention of um, you know, biological weapons fits into that um, that broader um, framework as well. I've spoken for quite a long time, so I think I should I should stop there. But happy if there are more. No, thank you. There's just one more question for you. And I can see this. It comes from Dr. Ruchita Berry. She wants to know if you can share share your views about the kind of support that uh, exists for the BWC uh, from across Africa, because she believes that there are several countries in Africa that are not still they're still not parties to the convention. And uh, while I uh, wait for you to comment on that, I will also read out a question that is. Uh, directed by Shambhavi Nayak uh, to Ambassador Pankaj Sharma in Geneva. She asks, who makes the, uh, the decision if an outbreak is natural or deliberate? And what exactly is the process for arriving at such a conclusion? I think personally that that's a very interesting question. Um, and, and really, because it seems you are in a silo of your own and the WHO is in a silo of its own. And if you don't have that interlinkage, then how do you really conclude uh, on, on any matter? Uh, Dr. Meena Singh Roy uh, of our institute asks, uh, oh, just a minute, there was another one that flashed up. I was trying to read one. Uh, hang on. This is, uh, uh, she says, there are some reports to suggest that China and Iran have an ongoing uh, cooperation uh, on biological weapons and what uh, what's your comment on that um and then there is of course uh, our uh, very much uh, uh, you know revered expert 
uh, that was referred to, he, he was referred to by Dr. Pankaj Sharma as well. That is the original Mr. Sharma, that's Ambassador Shield Khan Sharma, who, do you want to take the floor? Shield, do you want to take the floor? Rather, rather than my read out your question, I am you know, very happy if you can unmute your mic and ask your question or make your comment. Go ahead, please. Ambassador Shield Khan Sharma. Thank you. Thank you, Sujan. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Noah Parikar Institute, uh, for inviting us for this. And I want to particularly thank uh, Daniel Feeks for a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation of the situation where the BWC finds itself. Uh, and of course, my uh, dear old friend Pankaj Sharma for uh, bringing me in in this manner. Uh, so my greetings to everyone and to him also for his presentation. Uh, my question to you, uh, uh, Mr. Feeks, uh, is that, uh, or if, I don't mind, if you don't mind, can I call you Daniel, uh, is that, uh, you know, you have tried to skirt the, the problem and, and, you know, steer clear of the difficult issues. And you actually, what you presented showed how to deal with this problem without, uh, you know, given the pre present constraints. Uh, but I dealt with the IAEA for a very long time which uh, actually did not have any disarmament teeth. But over the years, it developed through successive work and cooperation, uh, a, a, you know, formidable uh, institutional network for uh, doing verification. And uh, it has now been acknowledged. Now, do you think uh, that kind of a process be, uh, uh, can be visualized in terms of uh, the BWC convention working in sync with WHO, which is the peaceful dimension of, uh, uh, you know, cooperation, international cooperation in these areas. And whether the WHO can actually, just as the IAEA has done over the years, over the last uh, 60, 70 years, can they develop uh, some of these things which you have point out in your presentation, which are needed, but for which we have to go really uh, from, you know, with this very limited three-member mem three team and, uh, uh, you know, five-year gaps, uh, can there be some kind of a regular, uh, uh, you know, process under WHO to get information which is relevant to BWC? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Daniel, have you seen uh, another question addressed to you privately by Ambassador Anil Vadwa? I hope you've read that. Yes. 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 And I if, saw if, that. If, uh, yes. Since I can't share it with others, can you uh, let us know or... Uh, Sure. Uh, uh, does does uh, Anil, do you want to come in and ask your question so that others know what the question is? Happy to unmute your mic, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's another ambassador who has dealt with uh, issues, uh, you know, de disarmament and this, the, the Chemical Weapons Convention and, and all sorts of things. Go ahead, Anil, floor is yours. Thank you, Sujan. Thank you, Daniel, for this um, overview of the BWC. My question, which is on the chat uh, before you, is, um, you know, we had negotiations for a protocol, uh, including verification measures uh, till 2001 for the BWC. Now, what are the constraints today, as you see, in reviving these negotiations? And um, in the light of COVID-19, um, this seems to be even more appropriate because we already have a CWC verification procedure, and that's a precedent. So, and... A second part of my question was, are the Wuhan laboratories participating in the capacity building network? Thank you, um, uh, Anil, for that question. Uh, now, before I turn to you, Daniel, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Pankaj Sharma because there was a question addressed to him. After he finishes, uh, I'd like to come back to you because uh, you can then wrap it all up. Uh, yes, uh, please unmute Dr. Pankaj Sharma's mic. Go ahead, please, Pankaj. Uh, sir, thank you, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Shambhavi for that question. Uh, the answer is very simple and lies uh, in the convention itself. In fact, Article 6 of the convention provides very clearly the procedure for such an investigation. If any state party believes that it has been subject to an uh, outbreak or an attack, by a deliberate attack by biological or toxin, toxic weapon, it can refer to Security Council, and then this, it is for the Security Council to launch an investigation. Uh, so it will be the Security Council which will decide whether it was a natural outbreak or a deliberate outbreak. But, uh, Pankaj, I think what she really meant through this question was a little broader than that. Uh, I think she was implying situations, you know, you sometimes read about terrorists 
who are actually making a bomb. They want to go and kill people elsewhere. But then while making the bomb, it blows up and they're killed. Now, the whole point here is nobody's attacked them with a bomb. That they, 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 In the making of a bomb, they've got killed. So here the, the potential for a deliberate use of biological agents for, say, causing harm to others, uh, if in a hypothetical situation this backfires and spreads out, say, in one's own locale first, how do you investigate that? Because in such a situation, nobody's going to refer the matter to the UNSC. Uh, sir, the answer is very simple. In case nobody refers the matter to the Security Council, Security Council will not be able to undertake any steps. Uh, so the mandate of the Security Council is, again, very limited. It cannot take a suo moto cognizance of the issue unless uh, there are other mechanisms. But under the BWC, the procedures are very clear. Uh, and uh, uh, Security Council cannot come on its own. Uh, under the BWC. Maybe through another debate on Security Council on any matter, Security Council actually is master of its own procedures. It can uh, undertake a debate on any matter of international security. And in that case, a separate mechanism will kick in. But under BWC, the mandate is very clear. Yeah, I think that's the that's where that's the you know nub of the problem also, uh, the self-limitation there. And besides, uh, with the kind of veto system that exists in the UNSC, uh, you know, highly unequal system. It's like putting the uh, fox in charge of the chicken pen, you know. Uh, so if you put the fox in charge of the chicken coop, I mean, you you have a certain set of answers that you get. But anyhow, I now move to uh, Dr. Daniel Feeks again. The floor is yours. Thanks, Ambassador. And uh, thanks again to everyone for the questions. Also particularly nice to see Ambassador Wadwa there as well. Um, Anil Wadwa was my my first um, boss, basically, when I when I entered this area, when I started working at the OPCW in The Hague back in 1997. So it, it, he was the, the head of the government relations branch within the Secretariat there. So it's great to see him. I saw him when I was in Delhi back in January, and it's great to see him here again. Thanks for the, the, the question. Um, first one, you had a question about um, um, Africa, countries in Africa as well. The the person asking the question is indeed right. The I mentioned before we have 14 countries that haven't yet joined the BWC. The majority of those 14 are in fact um, African countries. Um, so we're working very hard. Most of those countries are countries that are in some kind of um, a rather fragile state or are dealing with um, you know, natural disasters or particularly kind of, you know, issues that are inevitably of a higher priority on their agendas. We're talking to them very frequently, either directly in their capitals or through their permanent missions here in Geneva to encourage them to join the convention. Those that we speak to always state that they don't have political issues with the convention. It's not a uh, you know, it's it's not to be implied that they are trying to, um, you know, retain the option of having a biological weapons program or anything like that. It's just that they really have prioritized and, you know, unfortunately, from our perspective, at least joining the BWC is not high enough yet on their list of priorities. But we have had some success. I mean, just last year, um, Tanzania um, finally ratified the BWC um, before that Central African Republic um, did so as well. So, you know, even countries like Central African Republic, which is a pretty resource um, poor country with some, you know, some pretty serious internal problems, decided to focus attention on this as well. And we've we've had similar um, positive news from um, South Sudan, um, from Djibouti and places like that as well. So we're working very closely. It's there, there's a lot of support. Um, within Africa as well and you know the African Union we organize meetings there on an annual basis in at its HQ in Addis Ababa and many African countries have fully um, come to terms and you know fully accept the importance of addressing biosecurity issues you know particularly because some of them have very porous borders for example in East Africa where they're dealing with you know terrorist groups um, and also because of the huge reliance in many African countries on livestock and on agriculture and they are aware of the issues that I mentioned before you know these diseases often affect animals and crops as well so there's a lot of support within Africa for the BWC and and also from those countries that we're still working with to join the BWC as well um, now, I think both Ambassador Wadwa and Sharma were talking about, you know, issues relating to verification and, you know, some things 
whether it's similar to IAEA safeguards, whether it's similar to OPCW verification regime. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, this was studied for a long time. Um, in fact, and negotiate, you know, there is a draft um, protocol to the BWC, and it would have been an additional protocol to the BWC. There is a draft one available on our um, website on the internet. You can you can see what was being proposed back then. There are hundreds, I think over 450 working papers on various issues relating to that as well. So, you know, this was an issue that was very, very deeply studied at the time. Um, as Ambassador Wadwa said, it was very closely modelled on what had just recently been agreed back in the 90s for the Chemical Weapons Convention, the same kind of verification system there as well, which itself was, you know, modelled quite closely on that, adopted for nuclear weapons under the safeguards. Um, one issue, I mean, you know, the, the protocol of negotiations in the end collapsed. The United States was, you know, publicly um, very clear that it, it reviewed the entire protocol, um, you know, text. It very clearly said it did not believe that the protocol would, um, you know, achieve um, effective verification. So it was the US which in 2001 rejected that protocol text and within the BWC because everything works by consensus, there was therefore no, no chance of making further progress when the US had you know, so clearly and publicly stated its opposition to that particular text. The issue doesn't obviously go away. It's, it's clear, you know, many, many countries still support um, a verification protocol either as soon as possible or in other cases as a final, you know, as an ultimate objective. It's quite widely shared that, you know, disarmament treaties to be effective require some kind of verification. That's that's quite widely um, shared amongst PWC states parties. So many countries agree with that. There's a, an issue in with some that want to, this to happen immediately to go back to, you know, say concluding the negotiations and others see it as a more incremental pro process where we take steps now um, that will lead eventually to this this ultimate goal. And it may be that what's happening now um, may well be um, re-energizing that whole discussion. We have, as I mentioned, MX5, um, one of these meetings of experts on institutional strengthening in which issues relating to um, verification can, can be raised. Uh, obviously, any state party can raise issues that it, wants it, well, that it wants to. It also, I mean, it will touch on this issue that came up a couple of times of defensive and offensive research. So, you know, the questions of why countries feel the need to do research, um, you know, whether it's defensive, whether it's, you know, maybe seen by some as being offensive research as well. Um, you know, verification in the sense of something similar to the PCW would have been able to address some of the issues around that much as OPCW does through its um, inspection regime and its declarations of um, national protective programs as well. Right now we have transparency largely done under the um, system of confidence building measures, which is is fairly limited with not particularly wide um, participation. We in fact never had more than 50% of countries participating in the, in the um, confidence building measures system. But that's one way. I mean, transparency, I think, is a, is a key here, whether we're talking about military defensive programs or um, government or you know commercial university you know private sector programs as well I think transparency is is a key thing and like I said before you know the global scientific community is a very open community in general and relies on international exchange and sharing of information um and they also asked about the lab in Wuhan I mean that lab there they actually do um, training they do offer capacity building it's part of China's um, specific national offer under Article 10 of the BWC. Every year they offer a capacity development, a kind of training course for experts, for scientists from developing countries. Um, I myself haven't physically been there, but I've participated virtually in, in both um, last year and, and the year before's course as well by giving lectures and things like that as well. So yeah, that, that lab is particularly active and experts from that lab are particularly active in terms of Article 10 and, you know, conducting training courses for experts from developing countries. And then I think one thing to, you know, 
the kind of final point, um, Ambassador, you mentioned yourself in your question, you know, you said the BWC operates in its silo and WHO operates in its silo. And I think that's, you know, that's that's obviously a common feature of the international system. These issues of silos, you know, different organizations or different topics falling within, you know, different silos. And I think that is something which we're trying to break down to the extent that we can. And again, there are obvious limitations in terms of political and legal mandates. But where we can, you know, where it's possible and where it's necessary, I think particularly the, the current Secretary General, our current um, High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, and, you know, many states' parties, as we see in the meetings of experts, are trying to break down these silos. We bring in more experts now. Um, states' parties themselves, it's, you know, one of these issues, the BWC in the past was pretty much serviced by um you know officials from like your your own ministry of external affairs you know ministries of defense it's very much a kind of seen as a security issue um so quite siloed itself at a national level whereas these days we see on delegations now not just the the security um people from mfas and mod's but also ministry of health will be there and science and technology education first responders so you know at the national level i think these silos are breaking down which is sometimes easier to do than at the international level but i think the same process needs to happen and is is starting to happen and i think this current pandemic will give a push to that to breaking down these um silos at the at the international level again within the limitations that are there in terms of legal and political mandates but that that doesn't always you know that doesn't mean that cooperation can't can't take place. We're actually, you know, the BWC review conference actually encourages the United Nations to coordinate among different international organizations on specific issues as well. And many of these issues obviously do require coordination because at the end of the day, the life sciences, biology cuts across so many different issues. And that's one of the most complicated factors going back to this issue of verification. I mean, for verification systems for nuclear weapon or nuclear material or chemical material you're dealing in large part with tangible items you know chemi chemical precursors or you know fissile material something that can be counted and, and verified and you know boxes ticked whereas in biology it's it's a very different situation because you're dealing at, at you know at, at the base is is you know um living organisms which reproduce which so, you know, the concepts of verification which applied to tangible items, like I said, chemical or nuclear materials, may not apply so well to biology, which is not to say that they shouldn't be, you know, attempts should not be made to come up with something. It's just to say that perhaps the, the verification um, provisions that could be applied to biology may need to look quite different to what applied to nuclear or chemical. Um, nuclear or chemical materials but again you know this was last studied in the 1990s 20 years ago so it may be time for you know a, a re um, you know a new look at those different issues particularly in the light of the technology technological changes in the time since but then anyway, I'll, I'll stop there because I've spoken for far too long but thank you again well thank you uh, dr. Daniel Fix. this actually brings us to the end of our most interesting webinar today uh, we have actually exceeded our time by a full 25 minutes and this couldn't have been possible without uh, the good grace and generosity with which uh, the keynote speaker dr daniel feeks made himself available so very patiently taking on all these uh, you know subsidiary uh, supplementary questions as well uh, in a way it's good that you joined us today and that uh, so many of your friends also uh, joined us today you were able to uh, re-establish your connect with them through a webinar uh, notably uh, you know of course uh, dr pankaj sharma you may see him or hear him more often uh, in geneva but then you were also able to reconnect with uh, other friends like dr shilkant sharma and ambassador anil vadwa so that's good for you as well and i hope you will make it a point to come again and join us on a webinar i couldn't uh, help leaving this uh, uh, webinar with the impression that uh, uh, the BWC uh, hasn't really been given the same kind of uh, thrust and importance uh, so far as uh, the global community has done with regard to the NPT and the CWC. Uh, so there is, of course, as you said, a very great need to strengthen the institutions, strengthen the networking. Uh, it's uh, imperative that silos be broken and above all uh, that uh, the convention 
uh, be fully implemented, uh, ensuring full compliance with it. And uh, it's also time that uh, uh, we we look at uh, uh, how best we can actually put in place uh, a comprehensive and legally binding protocol, non-discriminatory with a, a full sum, full bloom kind of verification uh, mechanism that can strengthen the norms. And this eventually would be for the benefit of mankind. So with these words, I wish you good health. Stay safe in Geneva. More power to your elbow in whatever it is that you are doing there. Uh, so I thank everyone, all participants, again profusely for joining us this afternoon. And I'm sure they all join me in thanking you particularly. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks thank you very, very much. much. Thank thanks you. to all participants. Thank you. Have a good day. Good day. Good evening. Thank you.